So good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to this webinar. It's really great that we can have um, this conversation in this difficult moment in our history. I'm sure we are all in different um, places of lockup or shutdowns. I, I, I can imagine uh, the, the challenges that we all face. So uh, despite this, it's, it's good that we could organize this. We could bring everyone together and just to inform everyone, um, not only are we going to be having this uh, webinar, but we're also recording live on two radio stations. It will also be recorded by one of the uh, uh, Cape Town TV. So um, I think the reach at the end of this uh, webinar will be, will be extensive. So welcome. And welcome to this, uh, in, it, I think it's the first public event of the South African BDS coalition. So it's really exciting since our uh, formation in February. Um, yeah, this is our, our moment of uh, building solidarity. The theme tonight, as we all know, is how do we build solidarity in the time of crisis during the COVID-19. We have three um, wonderful panelists, activists, militants, so it's really good and we'll have a good conversation. And we have um, Michaela from our BDS coalition and she'll talk a little bit, she'll kickstart, talk a little bit about what the BDS is, what we've done. And it's very brief so that we also, um, yeah, raise awareness of, of the attempt at building unity, Palestine solidarity. So, Michaela, over to you. Um, I just want to extend a very warm welcome to everyone that um, just joined the webinar. Uh, so, my name is Michaela, and I'm a member of the Interim Coordinating Committee of the New South African BDS Coalition. So, this committee was elected at the beginning of this year, towards the end of February. And our main purpose of this committee is to um, essentially work towards launching, um, work, to, work towards the official launch of the new, this new South African BDS coalition, uh, which we hope to officially launch later this year. So the establishment of this South African coalition is a response from a request made from the BDS um, National Committee. So that's the BNC, um, which is an organization that represents various uh, Palestinian political organizations as well as civil society organizations and the BNC is also um, responsible for coordinating the global BDS campaign. So the mandate of this new South African BDS coalition is essentially to represent and to coordinate South African Palestinian solidarity organizations, community organizations, civil society organizations um, and individuals in an attempt to collectively oppose apartheid Israel. Um, so if you're interested in staying up to date with like our campaigns, please follow us on um, our various social media platforms. We have Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, so you can find us under the, um, under the handle at SABDS Coalition. Um, and then lastly, on behalf of the committee, I just would like to reiterate um, that I'm so thankful for everyone for joining our first webinar, hopefully the first webinar, the series of web webinars to come. Um, and then I would also like to express that we are so honored to host um, tonight's distinguished speakers. Um, I know that every viewer watching today's um, webinar will leave having learned something, but um, more importantly, I hope that everyone leaves this webinar with a strength and sense of solidarity to the Palestinian community, as well as other um, various communities that are particular, uh, particularly vulnerable to the um, effects of the pandemic during this time due to their unjust um, circumstances. Um, so I leave you now to our guests who will engage us and I look forward to a robust discussion on South Africa, Palestine and global solidarity in the time of COVID-19. Thank you, uh, Michaela. So we're going to start with Mustafa again. I can only say welcome. Um, and it's really good to have you. We'll, 
the process is going to be 15 minutes presentation, then it's going to be Lydia, then it's going to be Adam. I am not going to use your time by introducing you. We've sent out a, a brochure so you can introduce yourselves as well. And then from there, we'll move on to questions and answer and a dialogue, et cetera. So Mustafa, it's over to you. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks to the BDS Coalition for organizing this uh, meeting. I'm very pleased to see all of you. And uh, I hope we can get over this difficult time. The whole humanity needs to do that. Uh, I'm Mustafa Barghouti. I am the leader of the Palestinian National Initiative, which is part of the, or one of the founders of the BDS movement in Palestine. And I'm also the president of the Palestinian Medical Relief Society. And I'm a medical doctor, as you know, so I have been involved since the very beginning of this uh, coronavirus epidemic in, uh, in efforts, medical efforts uh, on the ground. Uh, we've been working day and night to stop the spread of the disease in Palestine. Uh, I. Uh, will give you an, uh, a picture about what's happening here in Palestine. But before I say that, let me express that uh, my view that uh, the coronavirus has exposed the horrible neoliberal economic system of the world. And it has really exposed the racist and fascist tendencies in this world. And it has really shown to the whole world how horrible has been the general uh, overall economic policy, which has ignored uh, the needs for healthcare and ignored the needs for health research and the needs for better education. And now the whole humanity is paying the price for that. The lack of equipment, the lack of tests, the lack of technology to develop quickly vaccinating vaccines. This is uh, something that is costing the humanity a lot of lives today. And that is a lesson that nobody should forget after this disease is over. Because in my opinion, what we really need is a world revolution to change this whole system that we live in. Uh, the situation in Palestine, like in many other countries, is uh, difficult. Uh, but we have been good in terms of uh, starting very early uh, the lockdown measures. We realized that we are uh, having a very poor infrastructure due to occupation, due to the siege we are subjected to, and due to the system of racial discrimination and apartheid. So from the very beginning, we realized as Palestinians that we cannot afford to have so many cases, and especially seriously sick cases, because we simply cannot handle them with the infrastructure we have. And that's why our all efforts have been directed at prevention. And we've really succeeded so far in uh, limiting the number of cases. But that doesn't mean we are safe because the risks are there. We have had a strong rise in the number of cases this week. We expect even more next week and I will explain to you why. But at the moment we have about uh, 400 cases in Palestine, 118 of which are in Jerusalem, East Jerusalem which is totally neglected and discriminated against by the Israeli occupying authorities. In comparison, Israel has 12,500 cases and 126 deaths. On our side, we had only two people dead, uh, but uh, I have to include Palestinians in other places. For instance, we have about 400 cases of the disease in uh, 1948 areas, which is inside Israel itself among Palestinians. We have 700 Palestinians infected worldwide, especially in countries like Europe and the United States. And unfortunately, 32 people have died. 32 Palestinians have died in these places. So if we include all the places together, uh, we are having about uh, uh, 1,500 cases of Palestinians uh, infected with this disease. In Palestine, we are suffering from a system of discrimination. To give you an idea, Israel has uh, 3,300 respirators, which means one respirator per 2,700 people. 
while in West Bank, we have only 213 respirators, which means one respirator for every 11,700 people. That shows you how difficult our infrastructure is. But in Gaza, it's even worse because in Gaza, they have only 82 respirators, which means one respirator per 25,000 people. One of the major problems we face is the lack of tests. We don't have sufficient number of tests. Israel has not been cooperative, uh, especially in the case of Gaza. And uh, that's why today, uh, while, uh, as you know, the World Health Organization counts the number of tests per 1 million people, in the case of Israel, they have 13,600 tests per million in comparison, for instance, with 7,500 in the United States. While in the West Bank, we only have 3,150 tests per million people. And in Gaza, only 1,000 tests per 1 million people. This is dangerous. Why? Because it could mean that there are many sick people who are not discovered, who are not diagnosed, and who could be infecting other people because of lack of tests. We have been working with WHO and pressuring uh, WHO and the world community to provide more tests to Gaza. But unfortunately, up till now, the situation is not, uh, is not good. What is interesting here to note is that in the case of the West Bank, 12% uh, of the cases we had are out of, uh, are due to contact with uh, foreign tourists who were visiting the country, especially in Bethlehem area. But that aspect, that channel is finished. No more tourists now. 11% of the people infected came from abroad because they were students or business people living in other countries and they were infected. And so when they came back, they infected few other people. But the, main, the vast majority of the infections we get, 74% of the cases are coming through workers in Israel. The, the Palestinian workers who are obliged to go and work in settlements, illegal settlements, or in Israel itself, uh, because of uh, the very high rate of unemployment in Palestine, those workers come back with the disease. We demanded from WHO and from uh, different uh, other parties that Israel would conduct tests for these workers before they come back, but Israel refused. Israel promised in the beginning that they will provide proper shelters to these workers so they would, that would, they would not commute. But actually what they provided was horrible shelters that do not have the basic elements of hygiene and uh, that were insulting really to the dignity of these workers. And that's why most of them wanted to come back home. But when they came back home, because they were not tested before, and although some of them went into quarantine, they infected other people. And that's why 74% of the cases we have are coming from Israel because of the workers who work there. Gaza represents a very difficult special place. In Gaza, uh, as you know, it's under siege for more than 14 years now. Uh, Gaza does not have electricity for more than five to eight hours a day. Uh, Gaza does not have energy or electricity to treat sewage systems, and that's why sewage runs openly in the streets. Uh, the unemployment rate in Gaza is uh, no less than 50%, and among young educated people is about 80%. The level of poverty is unprecedented. Of course, poverty means weak immunity, and weak immunity means more vulnerability to this disease. Uh, unfortunately, all the pressures up till now have not succeeded in forcing Israel to end this terrible siege that is imposed on Gaza. So far, we had 13 cases there, uh, mainly uh, through people who came from abroad. But we don't know if we are not having other cases of people who are infected and that we don't know about. One major concern we have is the severe discrimination that Israel is practicing against Palestinians, whether in the number of tests, or in terms of the provision of health education. And when we do it ourselves, like in the case of Jerusalem, Palestinian medical relief teams distributed leaflets all over the country, about 350,000 of them. But our teams in Jerusalem were, were arrested 
and prevented from entering the old city for no reason but that they were trying to send and to, to, bring, to, to bring information to the population, to Palestinian population about how to prevent coronavirus. When our team started disinfecting places and neighborhoods, especially poor areas in Jerusalem, they were also arrested. When we formed self-help committees in neighborhoods of Jerusalem, like Silwan or in Kufar Aqab or in Qalandia or in other places, the Israeli army would invade the place and, and crack down on these local committees. So not only they are not helping, not only they are discriminating against us, but actually they are conducting a horrible oppression to prevent us from helping ourselves. Uh, one major concern we have is the situation with Palestinian prisoners in Israeli jails. We know that there are many uh, officers and soldiers who were infected and they could have infected the prisoners themselves. We demanded the release of these prisoners. These are not criminals. Many other countries have released prisoners who are criminals, but our prisoners are not criminals. They are freedom fighters. They are political prisoners. We demanded their release, but Israel did not listen. Even the very old prisoners, some of them are 75, 78. Some of them are suffering from cancer. Some of them are suffering from serious uh, non-communicable diseases like hypertension, diabetes, which makes them definitely more vulnerable. And up till now, the pressure did not succeed. And we need international solidarity to pressure Israel to release at least the sick prisoners and the very old and the young, the children and the women. Uh, let me say that not only they are not releasing prisoners, but actually they are arresting more people. Since the beginning of the corona epidemic, Israel did not stop its invasion uh, in different places, did not stop its actions against Palestinian people, and did not stop increasing the number of Palestinian prisoners in Israeli jails. Uh, I want to say that uh, in addition to that, we are facing attacks from settlers, facing invasions of Israeli soldiers in Bedouin communities in Area C, I personally visited these areas who lack basic health care, and we are trying to provide it to them as civil society organizations. But they tell us that they are so worried because each time the Israeli army invades their territory, they are very worried that they could be bringing the infection with them. Uh, I want to say at the end that regardless of the difficulty and uh, that we are facing and the threat that we have, uh, they the Palestinian people have shown an amazing level of resilience. I think what we learned through the Intifada, the first Intifada, the second Intifada, through during the Israeli total invasion, and during all these years of occupation, the ability to self-organize, the ability to be in solidarity with each other, the ability to be resilient in difficult times. Uh, we've been used to having curfews. We were under curfew for 36 days during the Gulf War. We were under curfew during the uh, second and first Intifada. Uh, this time we are experiencing it with the rest of the world, not alone. But we have a lot of resilience and I'm so proud of our people. I'm so proud of the fact that regardless of the poor infrastructure we have, regardless of the fact that Israel is oppressing us and discriminating against us, Regardless of the lack of resources we have, we've managed really to control the disease so far, better than many, many, many other countries. I think that is a result of our resilience, a result of our internal solidarity between Palestinians, and we intend to keep that. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much. I think it's, I wish we could have more time and uh, possibly come back uh, to, to continue the conversation with you. I think it's been useful for people to hear firsthand what is happening. So thank you very much. We're going to move to Lydia and she's going to talk a little bit about um, what's happening in South Africa. Lydia is also a medical doctor 
and an activist like you. I think you're both in the people's health movement, actually. So there is a connection. Um, Lydia will talk about our situation and the linkages of how we can build solidarity. Thanks, Lydia. Welcome to Thanks. next. Thanks very much, Marcia. Thank you, and 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 thank you to Mustafa for that for that um, very worrying but also very inspiring input about what is happening um, on the ground in Palestine. And I think the parallels are, are already so obvious. Um, I I don't really need to say to the South Africans that may be on the on the group, but for others that um, you know this COVID nineteen epidemic lands as a crisis on a crisis, on a social, economic and health crisis in our country. And it's a crisis that's not accidental. It's created by the political and economic system um, that we live under, which is constructed through the decades and actually centuries of, of racial capitalism before 1994. And post-1994, the, the shameful lack of commitment to changing the living conditions of the vast majority of our people so coronavirus hit our shores um, on the uh, 5th of March uh, with our first positive case. Um, and we had our first death on the 27th of March. We now have 2,500 positive um, tests for coronavirus and 34 deaths. Um, and and the, there is a lot of discussion about the unfolding of the epidemic. Um, but I think what we need to say first is um, what we grappled with immediately in South Africa is this um, incredible segregation of our society, that we have 13% of the population living in informal settlements, 9 million children um, that are dependent on school nutrition schemes and are at risk of hunger. Um, and so the, the requirements for prevention of transmission of the COVID-19 epidemic um, are very, very difficult to implement in many, many communities in South Africa. The other aspect of the crisis that this has landed in is that we have the most unequal health system in the world. Not only are we the most unequal country in the world in terms of economics, but we also have the biggest private sector proportional to total health expenditure in the world, bigger than the US, and it's, it's bigger than um, many other countries that, that do not have universal health coverage. Um, and, and this inequality in health services has deepened um, since 1994 with increasing privatization of services. So we know that 85% of our population um, is dependent on the public health system, which receives about 45% of the total health expenditure. And the bed numbers are, are similar actually between our public and our private health systems in terms of um, what Mustafa outlined in terms of ventilators for population. We have about three and a half thousand ventilators in South Africa and two, about 65% of those are in the private sector, which is only servicing 15% of the population. We also have a health system that is very hospice centric, that is not based on primary health care, that is not rooted in communities and that does not empower people. And now we have an epidemic where we need people to practice um, safe public health practices, to wash hands, to keep physical distancing, to have an understanding of how this epidemic spreads. And we do not have um, the necessary health workers on the ground, such as community health workers to do this work because they have been systematically undermined, um, untrained. They have not received necessary personal protective equipment. Um, nor the recognition that community health workers need. In fact, community health workers in South Africa have been battling for more than a decade to get recognition within the health system. So, so the South African um, uh, response to COVID-19 has been applauded um, throughout the world and there have been many positive aspects. So we had an early lockdown on the 26th of March, closed our borders um, and the middle class really, I think have implemented the lockdown quite effectively which is possibly why we've had some control of, of the early spread of the epidemic. Also, we have a very segregated, class segregated society. Um, and, and we have numbers that at the moment are not in an exponentially rising curve, though we don't know where this will be in a week or two or three weeks time. But there have been problems with the lockdown. So the lockdown has been very militarized. Um, the police and army have been in the streets um, in townships to enforce the lockdown. 
often without the necessary humanitarian component that is required for such a health crisis, such as food, water, assistance with healthcare where required, or even just information about how to really do a lockdown when you live in a house where you share a room with eight, nine other people, uh, where there is no outside garden space for you to sit in um, if you're at home for three weeks. And actually where they're at a very basic level is just food insecurity. Uh, many, many, many people are in informal jobs in the informal sector where not going to work means that they simply cannot eat. So the lockdown at, at the highest level has, has been a success, but on the ground has resulted in massive, massive suffering for millions of people. And this week in the third week of the lockdown, we're starting to see the results of that with the beginnings of what could become food riots, uh, food rebellions, um, people fighting over food parcels um, or even breaking into stores in order to get food. And this is really an indictment on, on our government and, and what has been happening. So what has the citizen response been to this? Um, so um, like Palestine, South Africa has a rich history of social mobilization um, and leadership coming from the bottom. Um, and people have been organizing from the beginning, realizing that in order for this response to be a just response that does not deepen inequality, we would need to be organized and mobilized to defend the most marginalized in South Africa. So um, the, I belong to a, an organization called the C19 People's Coalition, which has got over 200 organizations organized around uh, water, sanitation, food, gender, workers' rights, economic rights, um, anti-repression as well as health issues um, and this network of people together with many many others have been assisting with food deliveries, assisting with public health messaging, um, sanitizer, water etc. Um, and one of the, the major issues that we have in this coalition is that there is a disconnect between the decisions that are taking place at the government level and even at the Department of Health level and what is happening on the ground and we're constantly battling to democratize our society as we move through this crisis because the response while it might be the correct public health response has been with an authoritarian government process and style which is something we need to struggle against so to end off i think that um the this our response to this epidemic and the suffering caused by this epidemic can catapult us in one of two directions it can deepen the inequality the fragmentation the insane cruelty of the system that we live in, or it could catapult us into a new kind of humanity where every single um, process involved in, in fighting this epidemic is one where we ensure that we decrease inequality, we build towards a single health system, we build towards community empowerment, we build solidarity, even though at this moment we have to have physical distancing from one another. I'll, I'll end there, thank you. Thank you, Lydia. I think um, Lydia was one of the first uh, people to challenge the term of uh, social distancing by uh, emphasizing the fact that we need physical distancing and social solidarity. And I think this is part of what we'll talk about after Adam. So welcome, Adam. I think the parallels are already big beginning to be drawn, um, we leave it to you to add to this um, picture. Uh, thank you very much, Mercy. And also I'd like to begin by thanking uh, Mustafa and Lydia uh, and the South African BDS Coalition for uh, inviting us to be on this panel tonight. Uh, I wanted to uh, begin firstly by saying uh, solidarity uh, to, to Palestine, uh, to South Africa and to elsewhere around the world that are, that are uh, people suffering from the pandemic. And, and I think um, one of the things that I really want to emphasize tonight is that a lot of the focus in the discussion we see on the media, the reporting in the media, particularly in somewhere like the UK where I am, uh, is very much uh, 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 focused on the situation in Europe and North America. Um, uh, and there's a lot that is missed out, I think, of the global dimension. And I think it's imperative. And I think uh, one of the things we, we're trying to do tonight is really get uh, give a sense of the, the danger um, that this pandemic presents to the rest of the world, the majority of the world, um, uh, and particularly to the global uh, poor. So I wanted to 
make three points um, tonight uh, and then wrap up with some conclusions about, about solidarity. Uh, I guess the first thing I wanted to say, and this really echoes with what both Mustafa and Lydia uh, have been speaking about, is that the social conditions in uh, places like Palestine, in places like South Africa, are very much structured by pre-existing colonial and racial relations um, uh, that have historic uh, uh, backgrounds, that have uh, uh, part of patterns of war, patterns of occupation, uh, sanctions, uh, blockades, uh, and very importantly, and this is a question I want to come back to, the issue of structural adjustment um, and uh, neoliberal structural adjustment um, globally. I think situating uh, these historical pre-existing relations um, that, are, that are part of how the, the global economy is structured is very important because this is really a prime determinant of the capacity of places um, such as Palestine, such as South Africa, to actually respond uh, to the, the pandemic uh, now. So I think this points to something very important that this is not simply just an epi epidemiological or uh, biological calamity, um, which is the way that I think it's often portrayed, um, particularly in the Western media, that this is actually a social and historical uh, uh, derived um, calamity that, that the world is facing. Um, the capacity of countries to resist, to uh, mitigate and to respond is determined by these larger structural um, forces. So Mustafa spoke about access to ICUs, to access to ventilators, um, uh, personal protective um, equipment, tests, uh, uh, the intersection of this with pre-existing comorbidities um, that, that uh, Lydia spoke to. Uh, and I think we can we can certainly see, for example, uh, somewhere like South. If we look across South Asia, for example, um, the average number of critical care beds in South Asia are uh, around 2.8 per 100,000 people. Um, uh, and as we know, one of the features of this pandemic is the large number of people who require intensive care or critical care and access to ventilators um, in, in the most serious cases. Bangladesh, for example, um, there, uh, there are 1,100 critical care beds for a population of uh, more than 157 million people. Um, so we can rightly look at somewhere like Italy, where uh, the, the average number of care beds is 12.5 per 100,000. We can see the disastrous situation that's unfolded over recent weeks in Italy. But Bangladesh, we're looking at a place of uh, a country where there's only 0.7 uh, ICU beds um, for 100,000 people. So the vast disparity that is is um, uh, largely a result of this um, these these structural forces that exist um, globally, I think, is really important to highlight and and to to make the point here that that the effects or the impact of COVID is not it does do, do not unfold in a vacuum. They unfold in these global um, global structures. The second thing I wanted to speak to, um, and this is something that Lydia also pointed to, is that the the, the questions of labour, I think, um, and also Mustafa spoke to this um, very importantly in, in the case of Palestine, the, the issues of how labour labor relations are structured in a particular country, the, the levels of inform, informal labour, the levels of precarity, the levels of poverty and working poor um, are also very much public health questions. Um, uh, one of the things that determines uh, whether uh, a country is able to uh, uh, to, to be locked down, um, uh, whether that is a viable strategy, is whether people have access um, to, to, to wages, access to salaries, access to means of living beyond just simple um, daily wages. And so where we have very, very high levels of informal um, labor, Middle East really stands out um, uh, globally around this, particularly in North Africa, but also um, uh, the rest of the African continent, uh, where we have this very high, millions of people working in, on a day-to-day -day basis, informal contracts, high levels of unemployment, high levels of working poor, it makes it very difficult for these uh, mitigation measures um, to actually be, be implemented. And I think um, this is, it's, it's not something that's just a feature of the Global South. It's part of the discussion, certainly, that's happening um, here in the UK. But I think uh, clearly uh, it's something that's, that's uh, uh, 
really a, again a public health a public health question because without such measures um, we we will undoubtedly see the health consequences um, of the pandemic um, increase I just want to point out the ILO International Labour Organization very early on in this pandemic, uh, I think over a month ago now, put out um, a report looking at um, working poor, the, the numbers of working poor. So these are people who work, but who work uh, and get paid um, uh, at less than uh, less than the poverty line. So we're talking here about three dollars uh, twenty uh, US dollars per day um, uh, is, is the, the measure the ILO used. They predicted that, um, and remember, this is early on in the in in in, um, in in the pandemic. They had one scenario where they predicted that the numbers of this of working poor will grow by around twenty million people um, globally. So I think. Understanding the way that this uh, this crisis intersects with um, uh, conditions of work is is very important. Uh, and Mustafa, I think, uh, highlighted this uh, when he talked about the way that Palestinian uh, labour, uh, Palestinian workers in Israel, um, displaced from factories, displaced from um, their their construction sites. Uh, and I believe, that, uh, if I'm not mistaken, construction is still going on um, in, in Israel um, today, uh, that these workers are, are uh, basically dumped at the border and then become the transmission vector for the virus um, into the rest of the, the, the population. The, the other side to this that I think is really important to, to, to mention and keep up front are the uh, uh, significant numbers of uh, refugees, uh, displaced people, and migrant workers um, globally who uh, find themselves, I think, in, in, in similar circumstances. Um, we can see uh, uh, from the Syrian conflict, um, uh, uh, the Middle East is now the site of the largest mass displacement um, in the world. Uh, many of those uh, refugees are internally displaced inside Syria or at, uh, uh, in, in places such as Lebanon, Turkey, uh, Jordan, uh, again, refugee camps um, and the precarious situation of, of people who are displaced from conflict um, really is a public health question as well. It needs to be seen and treated um, as a public health question. Mustafa referred to the, the situation in Gaza. We need to remember that 70% um, uh, of the population in Gaza are also refugees, um, uh, uh, descended from refugees from 1948. So um, the third point that I wanted to, to, to talk to uh, is looking a little bit beyond what, what, we're, what we're seeing now um, and to think about uh, the uh, clearly impending global uh, economic crisis um, that, uh, that uh, is certainly on the horizon. Um, the IMF uh, uh, released in their latest report just a, a day or so ago, um, they uh, predicted the worst downturn in living memory, global economic downturn in living memory. Um, they're predicting, uh, and we have to remember these are fast moving numbers, um, and unfortunately I think the only way they're going to move is go up, um, but they predicted uh, a nine trillion dollar contraction um, over 2020 and 2021 globally. Um, and just to put this into perspective, this is equivalent to the combined output of Germany and Japan. Uh, 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 this is the, 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 the prediction that's coming from, from the IMF. Now, this, there's a variety of reasons for this, um, uh, and I, I think uh, the, we should see the, the, the pandemic as a trigger for a much deeper um, malaise that marked the, has marked the global economy um, since the, the 2008 crisis. But, but certainly the pandemic has, um, through the shutting, simultaneous shutting down of, of uh, key economic sectors, um, the, 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 the fact that uh, so many people have, have been forced out of, of, of work, um, key industries um, uh, 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 shut down. Uh, this, is, this is really going to be um, a crisis that will uh, exceed in its scale um, the 2008-2009 um, downturn. So uh, this is, I think, really important to put up front now because, again, as, as we saw in 2008-2009, such global crises uh, hit uh, the global south um, uh, very severely uh, uh, through 
um, you know, uh, drops in, in investment levels, repatriation of capital, um, falling export levels, uh, uh, remittance flows um, uh, from migrant workers, uh, very important factor here also um, tend to drop in these kind of global global crises. So um, we, we need to see, I think, the, the, the pandemic um, alongside this, this uh, quite imminent global economic downturn uh, and the ways again that these um, will reinforce one another because it makes it, it's much more difficult for a country um, suffering and hit by such a crisis to respond um, effectively to, to a public health emergency um, that, that is clearly clearly here. Uh, and the, the one very important point I want to, to, to point to in terms of this global, um, the global economic situation and, and this, this crisis is the very high level Levels of debt um, that many countries in the South, Global South, um, are now facing. Uh, uh, this burden of debt um, makes it, again, very difficult um, to respond to uh, the pandemic. Um, in 2018, for example, there were uh, 46 countries globally that were spending, this is, so this is before the pandemic, were spending more on servicing their public debt uh, than they were on healthcare. Um, as a share of GDP. So um, this kind of, uh, uh, the, these very high levels of debt um, are important to point out um, because what we are seeing, despite the discussions at the level of the IMF and the World Bank around um, perhaps a, 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 um, a, a pause or temporary um, pause in, in, in debt repayments, that, uh, that these are uh, undoubtedly linked to um, further forms of conditionality for further forms of structural adjustment. Um, so, you know, crises uh, uh, tend to see those who have, who are the most powerful, um, uh, if they are able to kind of um, implement and, and utilize the crisis to implement measures that were previously off the books. And I think, unfortunately, um, the question of debt is really important because uh, uh, with further um, lending from institutions like the IMF and the World Bank, um, we will certainly see these, these loans tied to um, uh, more uh, structural adjustment measures. So I think this is something very important we need to watch out for. So I just want to end um, with, a, with a few words. I think um, obviously uh, uh, both Lydia and Mustafa pointed to the importance of um, a global and a, a global solidarity, a global perspective at this moment. Um, I, I've tried to point out that, and, and again echoing uh, the other two speakers, that this is not simply a public health question, it's a question linked um, very cl closely with social and economic conditions, um, with historical uh, 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 conditions um, that exist in, in, across the global south. Um, and I think uh, that points to one of the things that we, we need to, several things that we need to keep in mind. Um, I, I, I mentioned, for example, the question of debt. I think we need to be raising now very explicitly um, the end uh, 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 to the, this debt, the abolishment of these, these, uh, this third world debt or, or debt um, of, of heavily indebted countries in, in the global south. Um, it's not only immoral, um, it is something that is historically uh, unjust, it's something that um, has uh, uh, really uh, de de debilitated the ability of countries to, to respond to the pandemic. Secondly, um, uh, the question of uh, war, the question of occupation. Uh, Mustafa made a very eloquent point that it's the occupation um, uh, and it's the ongoing um, uh, uh, structures of Israeli apartheid um, that makes it uh, uh, difficult for uh, Palestinians to respond. Um, the clear answer is to call for an end to the blockade of Gaza, the end to occupation, opening up um, Palestine to, to the rest of the world, uh, an end to sanctions um, uh, across numerous countries um, in, in the South, Iran, Venezuela, Cuba and elsewhere. Um, uh, these, I think, really need to be seen as public health questions and as part of the response um, uh, uh, that, that we raise um, to, to the pandemic at this situation, in, in, at this current moment. So I'll end there and, and thank again um, uh, both the attendees and, and my uh, fellow panel. Thanks. So thank you. I, I, I think we need another hour. The, um, thank you very much, all of you, all three of you. The points you make, I think the, the multidimensional nature of the crisis, uh, bringing the issue, the um, historical debt 
the debt burden that will be added as we go forward, the destruction of the public health uh, service, the uh, impact um, of the, the, the pandemic on the global south. There are just many, many threads that we can be pulling. Um, but before I take us down those uh, avenues, I want to just um, list some of the questions and just to say to everybody on the webinar itself on Zoom, there are over a hundred uh, participants on Facebook. There are equally uh, many people and of course, there are all the listeners on the radio stations as well. So this is quite a large um, broadcast tonight, as it were, and a very important, I think, conversation. So one of the key questions is linked to the question, uh, I, I'll just uh, list them and then we can open the discussion from there. But the one was to talk a little bit more about uh, unemployment in Palestine and what would be the impact uh, of unemployment um, as we go forward, given the shutdown and given the way in which Israel has blockaded itself and so on, I mean, locked itself down, what is the impact of, on that, of unemployment on Palestinians? Then there's the question of solidarity. Lydia spoke about the fact that um, in South Africa, she's uh, referred to the C-19 uh, civil society organizations organizing themselves across different sectors um, to respond uh, to, to the crisis. What is happening uh, in, in uh, Palestine? How are you being organized? And then lastly, how can we build these kinds of linkages globally? So how can we make and, and, and connect uh, these uh, kinds of coalitions and how can we, um, I think, uh, take forward some of the experiences that the different coalitions are having. The, law, the other uh, critical question is also about the debt. Um, the, uh, how do we begin to rebuild the debt campaign? given the fact that most of the governments of Southern Africa or uh, Africa already preparing themselves to go um, to the IMF and the World Bank for loans. Um, how do we go forward on that? What do we do? And the last issue is around rebuilding uh, of the public health service. And what are some of the, um, your thoughts on those? issues. I start with um, Mustafa, then I'll go to Lydia and then to, to Adam. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. I uh, would, will try to respond to the questions. First of all, about the, um, the unemployment. Of course, it's going to hit us hard. We already had a very high percentage of uh, unemployment in the West Bank. It was about 30%. In Gaza Strip, it was no less than 50%. I think the overall unemployment has risen already to 50%. And uh, the particular uh, worry here is about the young educated people. Uh, in Gaza, it's more than 80% who are unemployed, who were unemployed. Now the number is going to increase in the West Bank to approximately 60% of the young educated people. 120,000 workers work in Israel. And uh, at least 80 to 90 percent of those will lose their jobs uh, for the time being. And in addition to that, there are at least 30 to 50,000 workers who completely lost their income uh, because of the uh, lockdown. The Palestinian Authority says that they will support some of these workers, but they are not promising any support really to the, uh, those who are working in Israel. And that's a problem. Uh, we think that uh, it is uh, very much, uh, I mean, that's what we are calling the government to do, which is to provide assistance, speci especially to those workers who are working in Israeli projects or settlements or uh, factories, and also to rechange the whole policy in Palestine to concentrate more on investing in health and agriculture. Uh, I think the total uh, the total budget for agriculture in Palestine is only 1% of the total uh, budget, 
while uh, about 28% to 30% goes to security apparatus, which is unable to protect us from this Israeli oppression. So of course, uh, there is a need for structural changes here and a need of more investment of the taxpayers' money in uh, the areas of health and education and agriculture, but especially in creating new jobs and in creating projects uh, for people so that they don't have to go and work in Israeli settlements or in Israeli factories. It's a long way, it's not easy, but unemployment is definitely a major problem. I want to comment on the issue of global issue, uh, how uh, our situation is related to the global situation in general. Uh, I personally believe this uh, coronavirus, and I wrote an article about this, maybe I can send it to you, uh, this coronavirus issue has exposed the neoliberal uh, oppressive system of the world. Uh, trillions of dollars were invested in military uh, equipment, uh, in military trade. Trillions of dollars are spent on spying to the level that every phone conversation today in the world, whether you through mobile phones or through landlines, is recorded. And uh, it is uh, sitting on uh, so many servers of different spying agencies in this world. The, the world, the people in the world lost their privacy because of that. And uh, there is so much investment, not only in military, but also in, uh, in monopolies. Uh, let me give you an idea here. For instance, uh, we know that in the uh, developing world, in many countries in Africa, uh, the expenditure on health does not exceed $40 per year per person. In the United States, it's $10,400 per year per capita, but most of it does not go to the improving the health of people. Most of it goes to profits of insurance companies and of pharmaceutical companies who are unable now to develop a proper vaccine for the people on time. And uh, in my opinion, this whole situation is unacceptable. Uh, one third, by the way, of the population in the United States did not have any form of health insurance uh, in the richest country in the world. So the world is wrong. The situation is wrong. What this virus has shown is that we live in a village, a world village. And the infection, the coronavirus is a global problem, a global epidemic. We live in a global world. And in my opinion, the solution has to be global. Uh, no single country alone can fix the problem. And uh, we need, after this coronavirus infection, I hope what we will see is a world revolution, a world uh, solidarity between people, but also a world movement to fix the system, to change the system, to revolutionize maybe the system, in the direction of social justice, in the direction of the, the needs of humanity as a whole. Nobody can protect himself without changing the world situation. Uh, as you can see, this virus did not distinguish between a rich or a poor. Uh, while in the, in, in, before, people did not think about healthcare in the world or about WHO, which, uh, which Trump wants to destroy now, because they thought that infections are only happening in developing countries and that they wouldn't touch them. But this new virus, in my opinion, has shown the deficit of that approach. And I want to warn, we will have a very big serious economic crisis. Uh, it was said that $9 trillion will be lost in terms of GDP. But let's remember what happened in 1929 when the world faced such a global problem. It, and we ended up with fascism. In, uh, in Germany and in Italy. And I don't think those who want to preserve their uh, interest in the world, uh, those who are running all these monopolies will just sit still. I'm sure they will try to impose maybe dictatorships, maybe more, more, more of their own interest. And that's why I think what we need is a global movement. And my last point here is directed to the young people. The, the, the young people in the world has been alienated from participating in political organizations and political movement and parties, etc., etc. I say to them, if you want to preserve your future, if you want to preserve your health, if you want to preserve 
your economy in the future, you have to engage and you have to organize. Without global now organization, we cannot fix this system in the world. Thank you so much. Thank you. There are lots more questions coming. I'll just allow the speakers to finish this round and then I'll come with a last round. We also have to manage the time very well. So Lydia, thanks. Um, thanks, thanks, Moshe. Um, I think um, Adam and Mustafa have, have spoken quite a lot of the of the economic issues, and I, I completely concur that this is the moment where we we have to disrupt the system. And and I love this, just to say that it's wrong, that the wrongness, that the irrationality of of the system. And what does that mean in what we do in each? aspect of the response at this moment. So in the economic system, what are the demands such as, for example, increasing the child support grant in South Africa or the basic income grant, um, looking at the protection of the public service in general from um, what we know just before, before the COVID epidemic um, became a, a major issue in South Africa, we were talking about a health budget cut um, at the last budget speech. Um, we were talking about cutting billions from the public sector wage bill. Um, those uh, conservative and anti-worker, anti-poor economic policies have to be opposed in this time with counter-progressive economic policies. So in the, in the arena of health, and someone's asked a question about how do we rebuild the public health systems. Um, in South Africa, what's going to happen in the next couple of weeks or months is we're going to see a situation where how we interface between public and private health systems will determine what we come out with at the other end. So if we have a health, public health system that is overwhelmed, and at that point, we contract in the private health sector at exorbitant fees, we will come out of this whole epidemic with a completely bankrupt um, public health system, a bankrupt Department of Health, um, and, a, and a health system that hasn't learned from this epidemic and hasn't changed. So our demands have to be Right now is our opportunity to build an integrated, unified public health system, which is based on social solidarity, not based on profit, where your access to healthcare is determined by your need and not by your insurance um, policy. So the medical insurance schemes need to be levied. The private hospital groups, we need to be sure that when patients are admitted, they are admitted regardless of whether they're public or private on their medical aid cards and the public health system must not be paying massive fees to these private hospitals for these admissions. Those are the kinds of demands that we have to put on the table in this moment because of this, this call for a whole of society response, which of course there must be, but we have to recognize that we, have, we are not coming into this as a, as a unified whole of society. We, we have an intensely class segregated society. Um, so as, as, um, uh, as activists, our response has to be, yes, we want to engage with this as a whole society response, but that means everybody contributes. Capital must contribute, the private health sector must contribute. And what we need to build towards at the end of this is that we don't have a private and a public health system, that we integrate and pull all of those resources into one health system that looks different to what we have right now. Adam. Uh, it's your turn. There are just so yes. many issues. I, I, I'm struggling to, we need another hour. Please, Adam. Uh, it's your okay, turn. so uh, firstly, I mean, I very much agree with uh, uh, the point Mustafa made about needing the need for people to become politically engaged, politically active um, in, in whatever way is possible at this moment. Um, and I think it's encouraging to see, uh, I mean, I've, I've seen this, uh, quite a number of different statements um, of, of demands um, of campaigns put out uh, globally by uh, popular organizations in Latin America, uh, in the Arab region, in Africa, um, uh, Southeast Asia. I think um, there's certainly like a, a, a you know, many of the issues that we're speaking about are, are common to all of these different regions. So I think um, looking at how ways that, of building those um, those links um, across different organizations um, uh, in the South is very important as well. Um, there was a question about the debt. Uh, I think uh, the question of, of the immediate demand of, of cancelling the debt um, really needs to be put up front uh, because uh, we need to remember that, well, two things we need to remember. One is that uh, the, the level of debt 
in the South has been increasing uh, significantly uh, since the 2008-2009 crisis, particularly in the last five years. Um, very high levels, um, basically across the board um, of, of, of debt in the South. Um, now, uh, that's the first thing. The second thing is that um, historically, and this is true today, uh, you know, we have an image in our mind of the global economy, of, of rich countries um, investing in, 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 in poorer countries. Actually, if we look at the way the world is structured, more money flows the other way through these mechanisms of, of, of debt. More money goes from the South to, to uh, richer, rich countries. The, the amount um, that countries borrow uh, is paid many times over um, through the debt service uh, uh, that, that, that uh, uh, countries are locked into. Um, so there, there is uh, 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 an immediate need um, on both moral, on public health grounds, um, uh, 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 to call for cancelling um, this debt, uh, and certainly not to take on any more debt with, uh, with further conditionalities um, linked to it. Uh, the other thing that I would say, which is important to realise at this particular moment, is that one of the effects of the crisis um, both the pandemic and the economic crisis, is that uh, the, the US dollar has actually been strengthening globally um, over, the, over the past um, month, a few months. Um, and what this means practically is that the burden of debt um, is actually increasing for countries in the South because their national currencies um, have weakened. So um, it's, 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 it's actually, the problem is, is, accentu is accentuated or, or, or deepening. So I think that the, the demand of, of cancelling the debt is very important. Um, uh, I very much agree with, with, with Lydia's comments about kind of, uh, you know, public health systems. Um, I think we need to, to remember, and this, this uh, crisis has illustrated this very clearly, that the problem isn't a lack of resources. It's not a, it's not a question that there's not enough to go around, there's not to spend on health, there's not enough to spend on education or housing or, or, or work. There's plenty of resources there. Um, the problem is uh, who controls those resources and who benefits um, from the existing, existing structures. So uh, I think this is graphically and starkly illustrated um, through the current uh, crisis. The only thing that I would add to what Lydia um, said is that I think also the question of, of pharmaceutical firms um, is very important to highlight here as well particularly as we see various, um, you know, either therapeutic treatments or vaccines um, uh, 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 coming out, uh, that, you know, we need to make sure that these are also available um, for people and not, um, you know, restricted or, 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 or uh, uh, used to lock countries further into debt um, uh, in order to, to be able to purchase and pay for those, those treatments. Thank you. So just to tell all the, the listeners, all the participants here, Mustafa is going to have to leave at 20 past eight. So if you see him disappearing, please um, know that he's made this, he told us this uh, long ago. Um, are we gonna have to go towards closure, but there's some key questions that you're all talking about. And I want to start where Mustafa um, started some uh, earlier and then just pull the thread. He makes the point that much of the resources that Adam is talking about, we have abundant resources, yet in most of our countries, the bulk of those resources are being spent on military, military hardware, surveillance, all of those kinds of expenditure. Further, we make the point that a lot of the research, the pharmaceutical research, et cetera, all of this has been done in, uh, by private companies as opposed to it being in, in the public domain, et cetera. So these are all aspects of this crisis that we're facing today when we talk about a health crisis, um, an economic crisis, et cetera. How do we take these issues now? How do we use this moment to raise the debate, to raise the awareness, to build the issues so that we also don't uh, simply get uh, um, this, the pandemic scares us into um, in our own little corners and there's no... Uh, um, 
real meaningful response. We don't turn, use this moment to turn uh, the tide. So I think this is a critical issue. The point that was made by Lydia, how do we disrupt? How do we build solidarity in a time of crisis? How do we make the linkages and build this political connections that you're talking about, Mustafa? Yeah. If we can use this as the roundup, the questions are a lot more about also how do we build uh, the Palestine solidarity movement, Mustafa? Well, I think uh, the issue of Palestine is very much related to the status of the world. Uh, I think uh, the tendencies that uh, are very dangerous that we have witnessed during the last years, whether uh, the policy of a person like Trump, by the way, who, who, who shamelessly decided now to cut the funding of the WHO exactly at a time when, when everybody should do that, trying to blame them for the problem of his bad behavior that led to so many deaths in the United States. This man is supporting now Israel to annex most of the Palestinian territory. While we are all fighting the coronavirus, plans are being prepared now by the administration of Mr. Trump and Netanyahu government and his other uh, alliance, allies to annex the Jordan Valley and the northern part of the Dead Sea and the settlement areas. That is exactly 62% of the West Bank. And that means the killing of the total possibility of any possibility of the establishment of a Palestinian state. Well, I am a person who believes that our struggle is a struggle against apartheid and not only for a state. And that means including all Palestinians. But I think at this time, uh, with what is happening and with the same racist policy that Israel is following, it is high time for a very big international solidarity movement for with Palestinian people, not only to let Palestinians be free from occupation and uh, in the West Bank and Gaza, and East Jerusalem, but also to end the system of apartheid all over Palestine and the whole of Palestine. Because unless we bring down this Israeli apartheid system, which is much worse than what prevailed in South Africa at one point of time, not, no justice will be here. And uh, that's why I think uh, maybe the corona issue will strengthen the, the feeling for stronger solidarity between people but in my opinion, it should strengthen the struggle against any system of racism, any system of apartheid, and any system of xenophobia uh, that we have witnessed in Europe, or uh, any attacks on immigrants, uh, as we have seen also in so many countries. Uh, I think uh, the corona problem could really open what was said before, which is that what we need today is more of social solidarity more solidarity between people. And that means greater support to the Palestinian struggle for justice. Um, Lydia? Um, thanks, Mustafa. And, and I think that um, as we mobilize more um, as civil society and um, politicize our response to the COVID-19 epidemic, Solidarity for Palestine must be on the agenda of those political movements at all times. Some of the things that we can share across our communities is grappling with um, some of the interventions required to prevent spread of this virus in overcrowded areas, in places we, we, we have limited access to health resources and basic communities, because those that are things that are common to the global south that are, makes this epidemic look different to a middle class sort of um, high income country epidemic, not to say that there are not class differences in those countries as well. So, so we look at solidarity in terms of sharing our experiences, but also solidarity, that there's a heightened consciousness of our oneness as, as a global humanity and as a global community. Um, I think as my, my sort of closing comments, you know, this is a virus that crosses borders, um, it crosses class lines, it crosses, crosses racial lines, religious lines, political lines, it doesn't stop anywhere. And so it really brings into stark um, relief the irrationality of our dividedness. And, and listening to some of the things that Mustafa is saying about how Israel is refusing to test, in, I mean, it's insane because 
the the health of the society in Israel is dependent on the health of society in, in, in Palestine and the health of, of every community and every nation is dependent on the country that um, deals with this in the, that has the least resources to deal with this epidemic. In other words, it's really the floor, not the ceiling, that's the issue here. So if there's one country that doesn't manage this COVID-19 epidemic, it affects the whole world. And so perhaps that consciousness is slowly going to grow because the, the nature of this particular virus is that it doesn't distinguish between any of the normal divi uh, divisions that, that are put up as artificial separations, whether that be nationality or, or borders or military checkpoints and so on. Um, so we need to be vigilant about the rise of the right wing, I agree. Um, we need to um, continue to strengthen the community mobilization. We need to continue to democratize our governments because this is also an opportunity for governments to suppress democracy in the name of a disaster. Um, and so just, you know, as, as a final thing, solidarity to, to our comrades and, and our, um, our friends in, in Palestine and, and also in the UK and all around the globe um, that we really are in this together. And, and if we strengthen our ties, we we may see a new world emerge from this. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Adam. Yes, uh, I, I mean, I very much agree with the, the comments both Mustafa and, and Lydia have, have just made. Uh, I, I do think it's really interesting, uh, the kind of large uh, variety of experiences and, and ways that people have attempted to um, organize at this current moment under lockdown. Um, and, and I think uh, uh, finding ways to share those uh, organizing experiences um, is, is really useful and important. So, you know, how do people actually make sure that, uh, uh, you know, it's certainly happening here in the UK, making sure that people um, who don't perhaps uh, um, who are marginalized or, 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 or facing um, uh, immense personal difficulties under a lockdown are, are actually being supported. So I think have, sharing some of those experiences in places like Palestine and South Africa um, is, 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 is both positive and does point to that different kind of future that Lydia um, was, was, was speaking to. Um, I think we need to remember that this is likely to be around with us um, uh, for quite a long time. We're not talking about something that's going to be over in a few weeks or a few months. Um, so I think we need to think about the long-term um, uh, uh, perspectives and implications for, for, for organizing. Um, and I just want to, again, just reiterate a point that I made um, earlier around uh, needing to see uh, the, 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 the broader economic crisis, um, I think, is going to move much more to the center um, of, of, this, of, of the issues that we face in, in, the, in the coming weeks and months. Um, so I think uh, making sure that what happened in 2008 and 2009 doesn't happen again, um, i.e. that this global crisis actually gets displaced um, onto the poorest populations globally, um, uh, that, that we need to be on the alert and, and be uh, thinking about this in, in, in that sense not simply as um, a question of public health, but also as a question of social and economic uh, justice. So I'll, I'll leave it there. And thank you again um, to both Mustafa and, uh, and Lydia and, and the BDS coalition. So I think the three speakers through our panel tonight, uh, through our conversation tonight, highlighted the irrationality of capitalism. It stares us in the face. And I think we should use this moment as we uh, heard tonight to build solidarity, to reimagine a different society, to strengthen our political organizing, to find new ways. This kind of um, method of tonight of building bridges, bringing different conversations into, into our uh, communities, making the linkages uh, this is going to be key as we go forward in, in the next couple of months. How we tackle the economic crisis, how we fight against the austerity, rebuild and focus on demanding the rebuilding of our public institutions, particularly the health sector, and defending democracy. Because we can see that they'll, they can easily be a slide. We already hear it in South Africa 
the bottle stores have all been closed. I'm just using the worst of the examples. There's no uh, access to alcohol during this period. And you can hear politicians saying, I think we're going to keep some of these uh, measures in place. So you more and more, you can see an encroachment on some of the democratic spaces of people. So um, tonight, I think is the beginning of a conversation. I hope we can continue a conversation with all of you as we build solidarity uh, globally, but also build solidarity with Palestine. Uh, thank you very much. And to all of you, and particularly the technical team in the background, thank you. And I think for the BDS um, coalition, uh, it was good that we did this tonight. Thank you, everybody. Good. Thank you. Any last points? No. Good. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much and good night.